Donald Trump spends a lot of time talking about how tough he is on crime, how he's a law and order president, but as I'm sure you know, he's had his own run-ins with the law, accused, among other things, of misusing charitable donations, suspicious tax write-offs that have been the focus of IRS investigations for years, and those are the kinds of behaviors, my next guest argues, that far too many people in a very small circle are able to get away with. In her new book, Big Dirty Money, Jennifer Taub writes, white-collar crime in America, such as fraud and embezzlement, costs victims an estimated $300 billion to $800 billion per year, and yet the usually white, wealthy perpetrators get, quote, first, second, third, and seemingly infinite chances. Sound familiar? Author and Western New England University law professor Jennifer Taub joins me now. Jennifer, congratulations. The book is epic. Well done. Thank you so much, Jim. I mean, in some ways, I'm sad that I had to write it, but also glad to have this opportunity to publish a book like this that challenges what's really broken right now. You know, the subtitle of your book is The Shocking Injustice and Unseen Cost of White Collar Crime. And one of the things you made me think about is there's white collar crime and there's white collar crime. There's Eric Garner, whose uh, crime, as you say, was cigarette tax evasion. And there's Donald Trump evading hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. The penalty for Garner is death. The penalty for Donald Trump is elevation to the White House. Is it all about one's positioning on the social and racial hierarchy of this country? Is that what it's about? In part, it really is. What we have now is a double standard in our criminal justice system where the very wealthy and well-connected cheat because they can corner the market on cheating. Others can't do that. They can avoid taxes. They can cheat consumers and their shareholders with very little, you know, really little response other than, you know, a slap on the wrist at best. What's mutual assured immunity mean? What does that mean? I coined this term mutually assured immunity to describe how it's not just this kind of implicit immunity for the upper class, but how they kind of protect each other. Um, and you can look at somebody like Jeff Epstein as mm -hmm. the case in point here, where it sure seems like um, he had a lot of dirt on others who had he either had on camera or he knew about their crimes and some very horrific crime. And yet... Um, you know, it seems like he got protected in the system, not for white collar crime, but then maybe got tangled up in some kind of kickbacks or whatever blackmail. And it's a kind of you don't even need to explicitly say to somebody, you know, cover up for me, I'll cover up for yeah. you. If you've been in the room where the bad stuff happens, everybody knows it. But it's not just a uh, billionaire or wealthy corporate guy to wealthy corporate guy. You make the case that even prosecutors in many cases and judges are sympathetic because they can relate to a lot of these wealthy, white, white-collar criminals, right? It's absolutely true. We tend to have a much larger reservoir for forgiveness and understanding for people who look like us that we identify with. And that may be human nature, but the problem is we don't um, the people in power tend not to extend that same kind of forgiveness to others. You know, uh, amongst, uh, I was going to say the only damage, and I should never use the word only, the damage done by many of these people is financial. And obviously you make the point clearly, it's not a victimless crimes. But in the case of the Sacklers, for example, you talk about beyond, behind Purdue Pharma and OxyContin in particular, it's not just financial, it's tens of thousands of lives lost. Explain to you mentioned Maura Healy, our attorney general, being the only attorney general in the United States who actually, when she brought civil action against them, which many have done, she didn't just do it against the company. She did it against the Sacklers as individuals. Why hasn't everybody done exactly what Healy did? Because historically, the Sackler family, that is the that are the owners of Purdue Pharma, have used the legal system to insulate themselves from liability civilly and criminally, and they've known how how to do that. And I think that what Maura Healy recognized is it's time to follow the money and say, you know, those people who made billions of dollars getting rich off peddling a highly addictive pharmaceutical for decades deserved accountability. You know, uh, 
One of the things, first of all, I started with Donald Trump today, and I should say one of the things that enrages me is that this is a, at least in my judgment, a bipartisan uh, a set of tolerance for this kind of behavior. And it reminded me reading your book, of, and you mentioned Eric Holder, Attorney General for Obama, when he's testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee, talk about coincidences. Chuck Grassley is the chair at the time. Here's Chairman Grassley and Eric Holder, Attorney General's response from 2013. On the issue of bank per prosecution, I'm concerned that we have a mentality of too big to jail in the financial sector. Uh, I don't have recollection of uh, DOJ uh, prosecuting uh, any high-profile financial criminal convictions in either companies or individuals. I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to, um, to prosecute them. It will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. You know, Jennifer, you mentioned that you have a list of six reforms. Two of the reforms are beefing up the Internal Revenue Service so that they can audit not just the little guys, but the big boys and girls, too, and create a special division in the Department of Justice. And the question for me is, does that pass the laugh test? One of the reasons these people get away with this is because they have collaborators in Congress who underfund the Internal Revenue Service, who underfund places of a Department of Justice so that the Eric Holders of the world have to come before Congress and say, we just don't have the resources. These people are so lawyered up. So even if your ideas are the right ideas, what's the evidence that the people who appropriate the money have any interest in catching any of these characters? Well, I guess my response is we've done it before and not that long ago. After the accounting scandals of the Enron era, there was a task mm -hmm. force and the wealthy were powerful then, too. And it was led by Andrew Weissman, and they cracked down. Um, but the, the other thing I, I want to say is that there's a kind of watershed moment here. We have this guy in the White House who's the commander in chief. I think people are really disgusted with where we've gotten to. And there might be an opportunity with a new administration to put the right people in place to, to make a difference. Um, also, in terms of funding, there's an idea that Professor John Coffey has of Columbia, which is outsource some of this. You know, the, there, there are agencies in the federal government that outsource to some of the most talented high um, high end law firms. You know, you can go ahead to head with these folks if you want to. You know, I was thinking of you yesterday. I was in the middle of reading your book when uh, Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse did one of the most brilliant tutorials, 30 minutes long yesterday, again today, by the way, on uh, dark money. And basically the message was, for those who haven't seen it, and they should, is you want to find out how these people are going to vote uh, that are these nominees. He basically said, without using these words, follow the money. Uh, it's all interconnected. Did you, when watching White House, he's essentially the other side of the same coin you're talking about, No. Yes, I mean, he's utterly brilliant on this point, not only with this confirmation hearing, but generally speaking, he's really been leading the charge in the Senate and has had bipartisan support on legislation to get behind some of this dark money. He has something called the Disclose Act, which is trying to get at these shell companies that incorporate right here in Delaware, you know, not offshore. You know, he recognizes mm -hmm. that the United States is a money laundering mecca. He held hearings um, he was part of hearings. He wasn't chair of the committee in the Senate, but hearings on um, kleptocracy in the United States. So he's someone to watch right now. Um, and I would love to get him a copy of my book soon um, to talk about these issues. And by the way, he makes the point, for those who haven't watched it, and again, you should, is, as you say, these shell companies, uh, when you pierce the veil, they're behind almost all of the organizations all of the amicus uh, friends of the court briefs that are filed, that there's this small universe of very wealthy individuals that is driving the nomination process and ultimately potentially determining what this court decides for, uh, uh, for decades to come. I want to return to what you said from our last minute about Biden. I know there was the time of the savings and loan where, what, a thousand bankers went to jail. New Deal, same thing. Enron, you mentioned. Are you saying what you said about a new era because you want it to happen or because there's any evidence to you, in hard evidence, that a, 
another administration would have an interest in making it happen. And I have 30 seconds left. I think the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration, does want to make it happen. I'm looking at the sounds that they make, um, the things that they're saying to support cleaning up corruption. And it's more than a hope. I think it's a vision. Well, let me just say your book is thoroughly depressing and thoroughly wonderful all in one, Jennifer Taub. So I really urge people to read it. It's great. Congratulations on your work. Thank you so much, Jim. The book again is Big Dirty Money, The Shocking Injustice and Unseen Cost of White Collar Crime.